Okay, so it's my great pleasure to welcome our next um, uh, guest, uh, Milusha Kinalova, who, um, who is an assistant uh, professor at the Department of Constitutional Law uh, at the Charles University uh, in, in Prague. Um, she earned her degrees uh, from the Faculty of Law, Charles University, and also from the Faculty of Law, University of Oxford. And she worked as a, a law clerk uh, in the um, Constitutional Court of the Czech Republic. So she has got a kind of experience, which is quite interesting for us also. Um, and when it comes to the title of the uh, of the lecture, Consciousness, Objection and Civil Disobedience. So I think that there will, there will be a huge discussion after the lecture. So, um, you know, the floor is yours, please. So thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me well? Is it fine? Perfect. So, uh, well, so as the title suggests, uh, the topic of the lecture is Conscientious Objection and Civil Disobedience. Uh, as you know, uh, while both Conscientious objection and civil disobedience are basically types of some disagreement with some kind of official policy or law. And I thought that uh, a good uh, beginning of the lecture could be by using one quote, uh, which I liked very much. It's a quote by a uh, Canadian philosopher, Kimberly Brownlee. Uh, and the quote says, dissent and disobedience are ancient practices that, that can excite reverence and resentment in seemingly equal measure. Uh, they are undoubtedly valued practices, but often they seem to be valued more in the abstract or in retrospect than in the moment. And I think that basically this is uh, the atmosphere, the tone of the lecture. We will basically try to see why is this phenomenon um, uh, uh, appearable with that we know that both contagious objection and civil disobedience have some worth some moral worth but on the other hand we also have reasons to be cautious of them okay so uh and before i start i would just like to say that many of the ideas uh on these uh concepts uh, have been created uh, in discussions with Andrzej Preuss, who is not here anymore, but uh, who lectured in the morning, because I uh, got to this topic uh, mostly through cooperation with him on the topic of conscientious objection in relation to compulsory uh, vaccination. So that was the start of my interest in uh, the overall concept of conscientious objection and civil disobedience. So uh, the main aim of the seminar or of the lecture will be basically to um, try to see the concepts conceptually, to see features they have in common, but also to be able to differentiate between them. Uh, I would like to discuss with you uh, the question of their legitimacy. Uh, I will let you vote uh, in a short while uh, about uh, what you think about the legitimacy of these concepts. Uh, we will talk about types of conscientious objection and of civil dis uh, disobedience. And of course, we will also uh, show and discuss or at least pinpoint some questions which both concepts uh, leave open. OK, so uh, at the very beginning, uh, I ask you, do you have some preliminary knowledge of, con of what conscientious objection and civil disobedience is? Some basic idea. Uh, I see no reaction, so I suppose that yes, and if no, it doesn't matter. Uh, but I would just uh, like to have you vote. Uh, what do you think is conscientious objection or, dis or civil disobedience like more justifiable in a democratic society? So who thinks that it is the conscientious objection? Very simply, my personal um, disrespect or disapproval with some practice, I do it uh, in my private life. I do not want to change the policy as such, but I want to protect my integrity. So that's conscientious objection. And on the other hand, civil disobedience, I want to be disobedient. I want to show that some practice or law is unjust. I want to change it. I want to be visible, etc. OK, so the vote is now. Who thinks that conscientious objection is the practice which is more uh, justifiable in a democratic society? Okay. 
who thinks that civil disobedience <laughs> is a more justified practice. I am. Okay, <laughs> fine. Okay, so at least several hands. For me, quite uh, surprisingly, actually, but we will see uh, your reasons why you think that uh, civil disobedience is more precious or justifiable or legitimate. Okay, so at the beginning, uh, I prepared uh, a list of 10 situations. Uh, I will also give you handouts. Uh, I have 20. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think we will manage actually. My colleagues need not have the handout. Perfect. So this is the handout. Um, perhaps somebody who prepares. We will sit down together. We sit down together, exactly. We have. And the handout is also something like a guide. So let me. The budget overview is where we are in the lecture. And basically, uh, I would like you not to look into the handout just now, just keep it next to you. But I would like you to, uh, if possible, create groups of three, four people, and together to assess, to assess those 10 situations which are on the screen, on the slide, and basically think as a group of whether the particular situations are examples of conscientious objection rather than civil disobedience or the other way around. Uh, perhaps to make a note, whether there are some factors which uh, are decisive uh, for your assessment. Uh, thirdly, whether you think that you would need some more information to decide. And just, you know, as like some background uh, ideas, what are basically the basic rights or public interests which are at stake in those situations? OK, so it's quite a lot of uh, questions. You do not need to really do it thoroughly. It's just for your basic introduction into the concept, okay? To basically highlight things which may be relevant for our assessment, okay? So, uh, if I may ask you, uh, naturally, just create some small groups. Uh, if you want to be a group of one person, can I move you somewhere? Thank you very much. And you have, uh, I don't think, like 12. 12 minutes to assess the individual situations and just make a note. OK, is this conscientious objection or is it rather civil disobedience? OK, do you need pants or are you OK? Yeah. I have to. If you need pants. There will be an exam in the end. Oh, really? No, I'm joking. <laughs> Yeah. 
C'est Thank <laughs> you. 
So some two, two more minutes, I think, and then we can start. So do you think, could we start? Yeah. Uh, was it an easy task for you? Uh, was everything clear cut? Did you know immediately whether it's a uh, conscientious objection or civil disobedience? So somebody uh, knocks that yes. Uh, OK, so let's see. Uh, basically, this is only preliminary. OK, so we will not really go into very much detail of the individ individual situations. Uh, but uh, it has its sense even in this in this way, rather preliminary one. OK, so the first situation uh, was uh, the one of a parent who uh, refuses to basically have vaccinated her underage child. Uh, it's a case of mandatory vaccination. And the argument was that it contains animal components which is uh, which are prohibited uh, by her religion. So uh, 
Which, uh, what do you think? Is it uh, CO or CD? Conscientious objection or civil disobedience? CO. 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 Okay. Um, could it change? Simple to choice to to version CO and CD for one situation. Yeah. If something well, that's uh, why I ask whether there are some uh, some factors which are decisive for your for your question. Because, for instance, if we uh, changed uh, the context a bit, say that we would put this uh, mother or father in a situation in which she does it publicly, claims it on TV, or you know wants to support her opinion, and basically uh, more public, that's it. Yeah. So then that it would be uh, moving more towards civil disobedience. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. OK, and uh, another thing is, which is relevant in this case, is uh, does it really have to be conscientious objection? Perhaps it could be just freedom of religion. OK, because uh, there are no there need to be any conscientious issue like right and wrong. You know, something deeply like moral bad or, or deeply uh, moral good. It can be just a practice of my religion. So that's another level which we could discuss. OK. But uh, definitely, if we should choose just on the basis of what we see on the screen, I would myself also say a conscientious objection. OK, as regards the basic rights, public interest issue. Without, you know, uh, further ado, of course, some freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, and then some public health, private health of the child, etc. OK, we could we could speak about that longer, of course. So uh, the second situation. A group of teachers in a demonstrative way boycott uh, the excess of students to a school building, referring to their deeply unsatisfactory and unjust wages. So that is. Yes, definitely civil disobedience. I think the most crucial terms is that it's a demonstrative way. So they really want to see it publicly. They want to show it that they disagree with the situation. And of course, uh, they breach the law because they don't have any right to block the access of students to to go to uh, to, the, to the school building. Okay. So uh, the third situation, again, a case of mandatory vaccination. But here you see that the reason has nothing to do with any kind of religion or some philosophical belief, but it's basically just a very strong conviction and fear that your child will be uh, like uh, affected as to its health by the vaccination. So what do you think? What would that be? I have made it a bit more difficult now, haven't I, by my questions? It's the same, it's a very strong Okay. Well, definitely, if I had to choose, I would definitely put a conscientious objection. I may have some inner doubts whether it is indeed conscientious objection because uh, it is not so clear cut. OK, for instance, if you now look at uh, the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, they are very strict uh, as regards uh, to what conscience basically uh, means. And uh, the case law is not completely clear, but one reading is that you basically have to base the strong conviction on some like belief system. It's not just your like inner feeling, inner fear. Okay, there must be some either religion or some philosophical belief behind that. Okay. Um, we, I think we wait for some other cases before the Strasbourg court to see what the situation is really. And I must say that even our constitutional court doesn't say it very strongly, okay, or doesn't say it too clearly. So, uh, to be honest with you, I myself would say it is conscientious objection, but I see that there can be some doubts for some people, okay, because of course they would say this is too subjective. Every anyone can say I am afraid to follow this law, then I want an exception from that law, okay. So that's it. Uh, situation number four, Dylan refuses a blood transfusion that could save his life. He's a uh, Jehovah a witness. You know that uh, there are uh, among some groups of uh, Jehovah witnesses, 
uh, this uh, reservation that they can't, or prohibition even, that they cannot uh, basically use blood of any other animal or human being. So what would you say? Oh. Okay, does everyone agree? Okay. Uh, religion. Okay. It could be a religion again. So that's one thing, okay, whether it's really conscientious objection or just objection based on one religion, on one's religion. But there could be also some other problem, and that is that you don't have any duty to let your life saved. So basically you don't breach, you don't violate any law. Okay, it's your inner decision, which is respected by law, that you didn't want to be saved. Okay. And in many medical systems, including the Czech one, and I'm sure that in Poland as well, people can say, stop my treatment. I don't want to be treated. Okay. And the state can't basically suppress your wish. So there are conceptions of conscientious objection that say that conscientious objection only relates to a breach or only concerns breaches of law. Okay. And if there is no breach of law, no conscientious objection. Okay. So just a question mark, again, not a clear-cut case. You find papers, very well-written papers, who say this is conscientious objection. And on the other hand, some authors say no, no way. Okay, so another another uh, interesting. I myself would say it's not conscientious objection. Uh, but I write it this way. Okay, good. Uh, The fifth situation, a group of environmental activists block the highway during the morning peak, carrying banners criticizing inadequate public and private responses to climate change. So what do you think? Civil disobedience. Civil disobedience. Yeah. Good. Um, there's a very interesting, and I will make a note. Uh, um, I think we will get to that point later. So uh, number six, uh, Mark refers to his pacifist convictions and opposes his draft to compulsory military service. That's a classical example of, of conscientious objection. Of course, again, if he persuaded others and wanted to make everything public, etc., again, we would move to some conscientious, uh, to some civil disobedience. Good. So uh, seven, Dan always crosses the street near to his house, not using the nearby the nearby zebra, claiming that it is the speedier way. It's just more handy for him to go here and not wait and you know, move to the zebra. So what do you think? None of them. None of them, why? Because it, 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 it doesn't have any objective understanding for that situation. It, it's not like, he he, he he have any rights or he has any strong convictions mm -hmm. that this is better or it's have the understanding of some of some of some basis that he have right to do it. Could it so become? Could it be? Activity against the law. Yes. Okay. Uh, just um, for the purposes of thinking, could it become a conscientious objection or civil disobedience in some kind of context, for instance? Imagine that there would be just one zebra in a 20 kilometers uh, long street. Okay, then that could have some meaning. And we could, depending on the context, again, see some conscientious objection aspect or, or civil disobedience aspect. Okay, so it's seven. Number eight, uh, Maria doesn't buy meat because she's a vegetarian. Vegetar what do you think? Neither. Yes, now you already see why do you say neither? Because it's a freedom of choice. There's no need, no legal duty to eat meat. Okay, good. If we were the proponents of the more like a wide conception of conscientious objection, we, could, we would be in the uh, Jehovah Witness and blood transfusion context. Okay, so then it would be conscientious objection. Okay. Uh, number nine, a group of youngsters 
set vehicles on fire, shouting slogans against the police's uh, alleged racism. So in the two uh, camps, COCD, where I think we could, or where you think we could move to active, um, in what sense? CD, because uh, it is the, uh, it is the, uh, this way, uh, it, it is uh, non active. Mm -hmm. So, but if you had to choose, you would definitely go more in the direction of the civil disobedience than conscientious objection. I think we are like in agreement on this. OK, so I think that the problematic uh, aspect here is the violence, uh, which you basically expose to object, not people in this in this context, but objects. But uh, I must tell you that there are conceptions uh, under even this situation could be civil disobedience, especially in recent times. Uh, we are witnesses to a more like, say, um, generous view of what actually civil disobedience may mean. And even violence is sometimes, according to many authors, um, justified. I'm not the fan of it. Yeah, yeah. But as I say, there is, they even call it a anarchic uh, term in the civil disobedience can that now there are many arguments. They say that in some context, even violence is okay. I don't agree myself, but I just tell you. But if I should decide, I would say it's not civil disobedience because of this violent aspect, but uh, I will do it this way. Just to show you the picture that today, as I said, you can uh, basically meet authors who even this would uh, put into the civil disobedience camp, okay, despite the violence. And number 10, uh, the anonymous members uh, hacked a Ministry of Defense uh, website extracting some sensitive data. So what do you think? So it's a group effort. It's, it's, it's always that people do such things, but they know that it's uh, that they This uh, choice is forbidden. Definitely, it's uh, well. Civil disobedience usually is doing something which is pro which is prohibited, which is forbidden. Uh, the main thing here is that uh, the members are like anonymous, and one of uh, the features of civil disobedience is publicity. I will talk about it later. So that could be the problematic issue. Okay, fine. So, uh, any questions? For nine in situation. Yes. It because I I disagree that this is civil disobedience. Yes. But but uh, is this is ch change something in that situation? If this uh, vehicles uh, will belong to the police or or because now it's just the, some random vehicles that. Standing in the, I, I think the, in the, in the, on the parking or something like that. But it, it, it is this, is this change something in this situation? Is this was the police, the vehicles? Not, not, not. Oh, yes, yeah. that would be. Just, yeah, definitely. I was also thinking about this. Uh, whether I should make it more like specific the case. If the vehicles were the police vehicles, then I would say that uh, we would move a bit more further to uh, civil disobedience. Yeah, because it would be more clear cut that you really protest against some policy of the police, etc. Okay, but I think that the really problematic issue is the violence in this in this context. Okay, good. So please, uh, now we move on, and uh, we can start to speak more uh, fully about conscience and conscientious objection. And uh, you have your hand out. So uh, I think. Oh, I omitted the quote, what, what a conscience could be, but I would like to ask you basically. Uh, let me start. Uh, how do you understand conscience? How does it differ from your thoughts? Simply thoughts, thinking. What is so special about conscience? You know that many people uh, died because of their conscience. They were prepared to die. 
So what's so strange, so special, so worth uh, on one's conscience? How do you, how can you say, I can't do it because it's against my conscience? How does it differ from mere thinking? Or perhaps if, even from your religion? Because you surely uh, follow some religious practices, or you may follow some religious practices, even though no conscience is present. It's maybe the fact that the conscious are so 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 much more stronger connection with ourselves mm -hmm. that, that 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 is a part of ourselves that if we delete in some way that we, we, we will lose some part of our personality. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, definitely conscience is, uh, I know I can use uh, the quote of uh, our teacher from uh, the Faculty of Law who no more teaches or teaches no more, but uh, I liked his definition of conscience. He said that it's an element of the inner human space, inner side, which evaluates or determines the behavior of the individual from the perspective of his moral or other principles. And uh, what is very special is that conscience of every human being is entirely individual, uh, despite its creation developed through culture, religious, ethical, or other, uh, other influences. And I must tell you that uh, when I read uh, books or papers on conscience, uh, you get to a very interesting history of what freedom of conscience looked like uh, in the Middle Ages and how it basically predated freedom of religion. Very interesting, very interesting topic and history. Uh, I very much recommend reading uh, Richard uh, Sarabji, the British uh, philosopher's book uh, on uh, moral conscience through the ages. And uh, basically what's very interesting is that, especially if you study uh, like Catholic uh, authors, they basically distinguish between uh, the so-called habitual conscience and actual conscience. I just want to explain because for me it's very interesting. Basically they say that every human being has some inner duty, very natural, to follow good and omit evil. Okay. And they say that this is the main motivation behind everything we do. In some way, it's always there. So this is some basic moral awareness of every person. Okay. And they say that you, they call this, this moral awareness, they call it synderesis or synderesis. And, uh, or happy true conscience. And they say that in normal human life, when you consider how to act, you basically, basically apply this actual conscience, the synderesis, the basic moral awareness, to the situation at hand. And this connection with the abstract principle, do not harm anybody, follow good, etc., with this current specific situation, that's your actual conscience. Okay. Uh, so that's that's conscience. And conscientious objection is what? Conscientious objection is usually understood. Uh, again, I put some quotation there, but if I should uh, like uh, say it bluntly, it's a basically uh, a refusal to conform to some legal rule or legal duty because of one's conscience. Okay. Sometimes conscientious objection can be understood not as the refusal itself, but uh, as a name for the reason behind the refusal, okay? But in most contexts, this is not uh, important, okay? So just say it's uh, a refusal. I disagree with some legal rule I uh, because of my conscience, and that's it. If that's conscientious uh, objection. And as I said, I believe that, or at least I will do it in this lecture, uh, I will follow the more narrow definition that conscientious objection is always a refusal to perform some legal duty, okay? Um, so you have to really um, refuse to comply with some legal rule, okay? Um, good, so it's conscientious objection. And uh, 
I just wanted to say a few words about its relationship to religion, because it's uh, very interesting. One connection we already mentioned that basically uh, there can be uh, some religious practices or duties which I follow simply because I um, believe in that religion and no conscientious objection, no conscience is present Okay, in that situation. So I can uh, have some religious attire, but it's nothing to do with my conscience. Uh, there can be also another situation that my religion tells me something, gives me some duty, but my conscience doesn't agree with that. Okay, so my conscience can be, in fact, in complete opposite to my religion. So that's another interesting thing. And then, of course, uh, you can have conscience, which is either religiously based. I have my conscience. I strongly believe because my religion told me so. But on the other hand, of course, even non-religious people have conscience. Okay, so basically both concepts can be completely independent and you can have also secular conscience, secular conscientious objection. And as you will see, this distinction also had a role, for instance, in the context of the Czech Republic and the case law of uh, our constitutional court. Okay, uh, I just basically moved uh, to types of conscientious objection and distinguished these two types, religious or secular. Uh, one interesting idea uh, which uh, relates to this uh, difference is whether uh, your conscience is a product of your uh, intelligence, of your upbringing, of your emotions. And I must tell you that uh, the more I read about the concept of conscience, I Thing that conscience is more a matter of your emotions rather than intelligence and you basically or your body or your brain only basically tries to develop arguments which intellectually support what you think uh, by your emotions as regards to your conscience okay but it's it's just my my idea good uh, another difference between uh, various types of conscientious objection is that we can speak about individual objections on the one hand and corporate. Uh, doesn't it sound strange to you? Corporate conscience. So what's so strange about it? Can somebody just say it explicitly? The corporate um, action, acting, uh, activity with the civil disobedience than the conscious because when we start uh, what I want to say that when one person say no to some to some rebel rule because of of, of her beliefs strong beliefs it's 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 more like a personal choice but when we add many many personal choice and and it becomes some medial medial thing it's more coming to the civil disobedience, but in practice it's not. But we may think that is it. Okay, thank you. Well, the reason which I think is problematic as regards corporate uh, conscientious objection is that basically uh, we are used to thinking or to join conscience with an indi individual human being, whereas it's strange to uh, like speak about conscience in relation to some corporation, to like artificial. Uh, individual or subject of law, okay? But uh, I don't know what's the situation in Poland. I will ask you further on, but uh, for instance, in the Czech Republic, we have examples when even basically artificial legal subjects have the right to say, we will not do this legal duty, okay? And the law accepts that. Uh, so, uh, the example is if you have, say, a religious um, or a hospital run by a religious uh, corporation, then that hospital can can uh, refuse to uh, do abortions, for instance. Okay, uh, not under every uh, occasions. If uh, the 
life of the mother would be in danger, even this, this society would have to do it, or at least uh, refer the person to elsewhere, to some other, uh, to some other uh, professional. But our law respects under certain contexts, even, even corporate uh, conscientious objections. Uh, one, uh, distinguish, one distinction which we also uh, use uh, in relation to conscientious objection is between conscientious refusal and evasion. Uh, the conscientious evasion, if I start with the latter one, basically means that you are doing something really in your private. You do not want to be seen. So, for instance, if uh, your government, uh, your, your law prohibits you to do some religious practice, uh, for instance, to ritually slaughter animals, but you do it in your backyard, you don't want anyone to see it, that's constitutional evasion. Whereas conscientious refusal is something which you which you really have to do or which you do, and you are watched by the by the authority, by public authority, by the state. You don't want to be public, but you are. It's it's visible. It's uh, it's not really in secret. Okay. Uh, and private and moral. Uh, this is uh, the last distinction about which I will speak, and. It's a distinction which um, is not very like easy, but basically uh, most authors, when they speak about conscientious objection, uh, they say that uh, the main idea behind conscientious objection is that you basically protect your inner uh, moral integrity. You don't want to change any law. Uh, the society can go as it wishes to go, but I myself want to have my clear conscience. I want to follow just my my whole my own integrity, my personal integrity, my morality. Uh, so this is the main uh, say understanding of conscientious objection that you do not appeal to any like more uh, more um, general principles of justice, etc. Okay. Hannah Arendt was, for instance, uh, like the proponent of this uh, very like private uh, conception of uh, contagious objection. Whereas, on the other hand, for instance, Michael Walter in his Fears of Justice, he basically understands contagious objection uh, in a more broad way and basically says even contagious objection is something where you appeal to some more general principles of justice. Okay, you feel them internally. But it's not just your private, private, private principles. OK, there must be something more general idea of justice behind that. OK, so. He basically uh, had a bit different view of what conscientious objection could could mean. So. Um, do you have any questions so far? Was there something which occurred to you like a strange? Which provoked some thought? Okay, uh, good. So uh, I'll ask you now. And this, I think it's again a very interesting, interesting uh, question. How should we justify conscientious objection? Okay, let's suppose that we should find some basic reason why the state should respect that a person says, I cannot do this. I can't follow, follow the rule. I can't follow the law because it is against my conscience. Why or how can we justify this situation? Is it worse? Is it only words, only, only words of this person? We, we can't uh, check it in the Okay, so you mean not empirically that you can you cannot check whether it's sincere, etc. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um if you look at the at the question of how I can justify uh conscientious objection or its acceptance, its recognition in the in the legal system, uh we said that it's an exception from some legal duty. Okay, I can 
say it more generally, it's an exception from some general legal uh, rule. It's an exception from some general legal rule. So if we look at it in terms of legal principles, what's the principle in law which is uh, interfered with? If I make an exception for somebody that he or she doesn't have to follow the rule, what's the principle which is, uh, I wouldn't say violated, but which is interfered with? Equality. Equality before law, exactly. Okay. So the one view, the one perspective which we could have in answering this question, how do I justify uh, the exception is, look, uh, equality of law is the basic principle upon which our legal system is based. And if you want to really make this exception, you really have to find very, very good reasons for that. Okay. This is the way uh, that I and my colleague uh, Andre Preuss always thought about this concept. But I must tell you our experience when we submitted a paper on contentious objection to uh, mandatory vaccination to uh, one European journal. They, uh, you know, made some comments to it, and one of the major, uh, basically, remarks and critiques was that. Uh, we are too one-sided. And they say, well, we think that basically a completely opposite uh, position should be applied. And it's not equality before law. <laughs> it is that every human person is holder of human rights. It's a subject of human rights with all their differences, etc. And it is the state which must justify why I want you and you and you and you to get your child vaccinated. It's not like the burden of proof on the state uh, in the sense that I have to find uh, the reason why I accept these persons from the rule. The other way around, you have to say, why shouldn't I accept the exceptions? The exceptions are completely natural. This is what they said to us. Okay, so and of course, and then again, they said, well, and also there is, of course, some discrimination topics. You basically have to say, why don't you, if these individual situations are in a similar position, uh, have they have there is the same legal duty, but one uh, says that it's against my conscience or my religion, and the other says it's not, how can you treat them the same way? Okay, if you do not want to discriminate, you really have to see the differences. And if you want them to, to, to be to act in the same way, you have to justify it very, very well. Otherwise, you are discriminating them. So, uh, no, it was a very interesting like discussion for us. Uh, and of course, I think that both views are legitimate and have to be watched. And it's really good to realize these two very opposing fundamental views about the legitimacy of conscientious objection. Okay, does it make sense? Or is it too abstract? Does it make sense? Okay, fine. Good. So uh, I just make a, a vote here. I'm really curious whether you are more on the side of the equality before law, i.e. we don't like exceptions, or we like exceptions because we are everyone different and this is an open society, etc. So who's for the yeah. equality? So yes. Can we be in the middle? Of this? Or she, I think everyone, or not everyone, but most of us will be somewhere in the middle. So uh, just you know, raise your hand for the 50 plus uh, variant. Okay. So who is more for this like cautious equality before the law um, principle or camp? Okay. And who is here? I mean, more the individual freedom. Is, okay. See. Younger generation, I think they it's very similar to my experience in, in the Czech Republic. Okay. Good, fine. So, uh -huh. no questions so far. If you disagreed with something, just please tell me. Okay, so we can move on. And uh, I will just, you know, to, bit, to speak a bit more uh, specifically. You know that there are various contexts in which conscientious objections can be applied. 
Uh, I choose those which are like more uh, most uh, close to me because of my research and also because of uh, the legal regulation in the Czech Republic, which is compulsory military service, mandatory vaccination and provision of medical services. And uh, I'm also interested in what's the situation in Poland, because I know that you don't have compulsory military service, uh, if my information is correct. Not, you don't, okay. But I think you have mandatory vaccination. Yes, so then I will definitely ask yes. what's about conscientious objection in your in your country. And of course, provision of medical services. It's another very interesting concept, but we could find many others. OK, uh, mayors refusing to uh, to uh, say that administer a marriage between uh, same sex couples, etc. Again, this could also go under the heading of conscientious objection at many, many other situations. That's actually the, the part of the problem that sometimes it's really very difficult uh, just to decide how should we analyze the problem? Is it discrimination issue? Is it freedom of religion issue? Is it a uh, conscientious objection issue? OK, and what test shall we apply? So it's very, very interesting. Uh, compulsory military service. Um, why is conscientious objection? Uh, problematic in the context of compulsory military service. What do you think? Because most definitely European countries and even the world countries now accept the possibility of having conscientious objection in relation to uh, compulsory military service. Um, even the Czech Republic, I will show you later. So um, what do you think could be the biggest uh, reason against accepting conscientious objections in relation to compulsory military service. Pacifism. Excuse me? Pacifism. Oh, uh, that would be the reason for like definitely secular or even religious uh, conscientious objection. Good. But what would be the reason against? Yes, again, that's that's a reason supporting why I object to compulsory service. But what could be the argument of the state against accepting the objection? Mainly because it comes of the safety of our state. Yes, exactly. And if you if you look at who's uh, the person who is um, usually under duty, legal duty to protect, it's a citizen. OK, and one of the basic duties of citizenship usually is to protect your country. OK, so this philosophical reason is one. Or philosophical, theoretical reason. Uh, and the other could be simply, of course, that people could use the argument just because they are either afraid or do not want to risk their lives, etc, etc, etc. OK, and if many people use this argument, then there will be no one who will protect the state. I must tell you that and my colleagues know that, that when I opened this concept, this question in relation to the Czech Republic, uh, we have compulsory military service, but only in very extraordinary situations. Basically, there must be some state of war or some state of very like uh, difficult um, danger to the state. And everyone thought, oh my goodness, it's such a nonsens nonsensical subject. Uh, you know, this is an outdated, we don't need uh, compulsory military service, etc. And then the war in Ukraine came. And I want to talk about it later, but if you saw our legal regulation of how easy it is to say that it's against my conscience to serve, it's so easy that it definitely would be also like, misused in, in practice. So, um, I think this is something which uh, states will in recent years, in uh, future years, have to deal with. OK, so that uh, they there remains somebody uh, who will protect countries. OK, so it's a compulsory military service. Uh, I wanted to speak about historical aspects of it, but uh, I don't I will not uh, take uh, any further time for this. Um, but I must say and mention what's the situation in uh, the European um, legal space. 
uh, because it's really interesting. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights for a very long time until basically 2011 refused that there is any conscientious objection in relation to compulsory military service, which would be protected under Article 9 of the European Convention on Human Rights, freedom of thought, uh, belief and religion. Uh, basically, with the argument that the convention itself in Article 4, I think, um, these are the forced labor provision. There is uh, some sentence which says that uh, a forced labor is not if the state, uh, if the state uh, like presses you, forces you to uh, have a compulsory military service or some alternate service. OK, so basically uh, European Commission on Human Rights and later European European Court of Human Rights of Human Rights argued See, the convention itself accepted that there can be compars, uh, com, uh, compulsory military service. So it's it's it made it doesn't make sense to argue that uh, the same convention, the identical convention would also protect the exception from it. But in 2011, uh, the case law changed in the case of Bayatayan against Armenia. And uh, so since 2011, uh, there is a right to conscientious objection uh, under Article 9, accepted. Okay, uh, it's not an absolute right, as other uh, basically subsections of uh, Article 9, paragraph 1, freedom of thought, religion, belief, etc. It is subject to possible limitations. Okay, but um, prima facie, there's a right to exercise your conscientious objection. Okay, and the state must be uh, very good in its argumentation to argue why in your particular case uh, the objection should not be accepted. Okay. Uh, and so this was 2011, European Court of Human Rights and Human Rights Committee accepted it in 1993. So basically many years before the European Court of Human Rights. And what is very special the Human Rights Committee treats the right to conscientious objection to compulsory military service as an absolute right, no limitation possible. Okay, so once you once you um, prove that you are real conscientious objector, according to Human Rights Committee, no way the state could limit this right. It's a very special, very strong absolutist conception of conscientious objection. Uh, the one which uh, the European Court of Human Rights does not follow. Okay, they accept limitations. Uh, good. Provision of uh, medical services. Um, I don't want to speak about that for a long time. I just want to tell you that, again, it's a problem now in many contexts. But especially if you uh, read uh, some recent empirical studies. For instance, uh, I read a study which was um, analyzing a questionnaire uh, which, was, uh, full, which was filled by uh, British students, medical students. And really very large percent, sometimes more than half of those students mm -hmm. in certain contexts, basically told that they believe that the physician or even other medical personnel can refuse to provide any medical procedure which is which is against their conscience and there are situations in which for instance muslim medical students refuse to take care of a female patient okay and really it was like it was tens of percents so they say that it's really potentially a very big problem for the future. Uh, that uh, there could be uh, too few physicians with no conscientious objections. Okay. I don't want to uh, to uh, to seem or to appear as somebody who is completely against conscientious objections, but I think that anyone can feel feel 
that it can be a problem. Okay, if there are people who decide that we, they will not treat women, for instance. Okay, so the state has the duty to to uh, guarantee medical care on equal terms. So definitely, this is something which, for instance, like civic education or education of medical students should definitely uh, like deal with and um, take care of it. Okay. Uh, good. If, yes. I, if I can yes. add something, it's uh, especially important in Poland, uh, the problem in Poland, because uh, we have something uh, which uh, which is called like clause of uh, conscience yes. uh, among uh, doctors. And uh, I'm wondering if in Czechia it's mm. something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely. Uh, I will go to it just on the next slide. It means that a doctor can refuse to do some procedure. Am I right? Okay, yeah, fine, good. But before I get to that, I want to basically introduce this topic in a more theoretic way, one which I think is interesting even for you, like in Poland, because a very difficult and interesting theoretical question is how or what is the legal basis of the right to conscientious objection? And basically, you can have two basic like paradigms of how to look at it. The first paradigm is to consider it only as a specific right. By that, I mean that basically, conscientious objections will be acceptable only in those situations which are explicitly provided in law. Okay, so the constitution or a normal statute or some case law, etc., say that in this situation you can exercise conscientious objection. Okay, it's a specific right only in really explicitly uh, stipulated situations. Okay, on the other hand, you can also understand the right to conscientious objection as a general right. By that, we could mean that you would say, OK, we have freedom of conscience. And within this freedom of conscience, there is some inherent part of it, component of it, which is the right to conscientious objection. OK, so I don't need to have any explicit provision in statutory regulations in the Constitution. I can devise or argue or claim or assert my right to conscientious objection simply because I have freedom of conscience. OK, does it make sense? Good. Uh, what do you think about those two conceptions? If you are here, the person who promotes or who uh, favors more equality before the law, would you be proponent of a specific right or general right conception? You want everyone is equal. We don't want exceptions. So what's uh, better for this provision, for this principle to be protected? Specific rules. Definitely, yeah, because that yes, situation yes, do this yes, because that we you can control it. You can control it in which kind of context you can use it. OK, on the other hand, if I'm here, I'm the person who as the basic principle sees the liberty of the individual and my dignity and everything, then I have my freedom of conscience. So yes, potentially everywhere is my right to conscientious objection. And I only have to be like a good lawyer or have a good lawyer behind me to argue why I can have the exception. OK, so um, we can basically argue for and against those two conceptions based on on which side we more lean to. OK. And it's very general and very natural that we do not agree, but that we not agree on it. OK, and it's legitimate that we do not agree. It's a nature of human person and human beings that we disagree. And sometimes we it's not our fault because it's our upbringing, our emotions, etc. Okay. So it's just our task is to be able to speak to each other and argue with each other in respect and in decency. OK. And now I can uh, move on to the Czech situation because it was exactly this idea about whether conscientious objection is the general or the specific right, 
which, which is relevant in our context. Uh, the Czech Charter of Fundamental Rights, that's our Bill of Rights, uh, has basically two provisions which are relevant uh, in this context, Articles 15 and 16. Uh, Article 15 doesn't have any limitation clause. Uh, basically, only says it, in paragraph one that there is some freedom of thought, conscience, and blah, blah, blah. Okay. And then in paragraph three, you have an explicit, basically, right to conscientious objection in relation to compulsory military service. So, as a principle, it was always clear that even the Constitution protects conscientious objection in relation to compulsory military service. So, it's Article 15, no limitation clause. And Article 16, freedom of religion, okay, including paragraph four, limitation clause. Uh, I can one. It's in your handout. I don't have it on the slide. Uh, if you look more into the Czech regulation, uh, what you see. As regards uh, the conscientious objection in relation to the military service, compulsory military service, I already said a few words about that. Basically, our compulsory military service can activate only in uh, like very strict emergency situations. But uh, we have law, statutory law, statutory regulation, subconstitutional legislation, which uh, basically regulates how you can use this uh, con uh, conscientious objection. Uh, from an academic point of view, but also from a practical point of view, it's very, um, how to say that, uh, uh, very partial because I think partly because of the reason that nobody thought it really important and necessary because we were in peace times. Uh, basically, it's just enough to say it's against my conscience to to be in um, to do the military service, and you write some paper, and that's it. Okay, there is no any full review of it, etc. But you have to do like alternative service. Okay, so. Um, that's compulsory military service. Another situation which we have, and now I get to your question, is the medical service context, where not only like individual medical professionals, nurses, physicians, other personnel, but also corporations, hospitals, really can say, we will not do this procedure because it's against our religion or conscience, okay? Uh, the law respects it. It's a specific right to conscientious objection with limits which are described in the legislation and which basically say that uh, you have to refer the person to some other individual or some other hospital who will commit that procedure for them, okay? And of course, if the life of the patient would be in danger, then you have to do it even against your conscience or religion. You have to help, okay? So there are these limits. The state uh, wants to protect the health and the life of the patient, okay? So is it the same as you have in Poland? Uh, no, not exactly. Uh because I don't know uh, how it is in uh, private uh, offices of doctors, but in uh, public hospitals, uh, each doctor uh, has, uh, has a right to, uh, to refuse uh, mm -hmm. doing some job of, of doctor because of uh, his or her uh, conscience. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is no duty to like uh, to uh, put you to some other physician or another hospital and which will guarantee you the service. Uh, no. I, I, I'm not sure, but probably not. Mm -hmm. but I, I don't know. Okay. I think it is. 
I think it is, but they don't want to do it all the time, especially concerning abortion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's supposed to, yeah, I'll give address to other physician, but I know that it's not respected at all concerning, mm -hmm. especially abortion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and now we can move to the third context, uh, which as regards uh, the case law of the Constitutional Court is, uh, I think, recently the most important one, and that is the compulsory vaccination. Uh, in the Czech Republic, we have, I think, like in Poland, very robust system of compulsory vaccination. Uh, there is a legal duty to basically uh, have your children vaccinated, and uh, apart from that, there is a duty of like um, educational authorities, educational bodies, to uh, basically make sure that your that the child which they enroll uh, is vaccinated. Okay, so there's like this double duty, double protection. And uh, what is interesting that um, in the context of compulsory vaccination. Uh, I think it was in uh, the beginning of uh, the 21st century, there was one case uh, dealing with a religious objection to compulsory vaccination. And at the time, it was no problem because um, the Constitutional Court said that uh, in the context of that particular case, because of the religious belief of the parent we are uh, in Article 16 context. It's your freedom to manifest religion. Okay, you object to uh, to the vaccination. Okay, uh, I, I don't think that this uh, decision would be any like controversial, etc. But uh, later on, uh, there were also parents who argued that uh, the compulsory vaccination of their child would not be against their religion, but against their conscience. Okay? And in this case, uh, I will call it conscientious objection judgment in, uh, decided by the first uh, Senate of the Constitutional Court at the time. The court said, on the basis of Article 15, i.e. just the provision which says the freedom of conscience is guaranteed, yes, you have the right to a conscientious objection in relation to compulsory vaccination. Okay, so even though if your objections are not religious, when you are in Article 16, and it's just secular objections, you are in Article 15, but still you have the right to conscientious objection, or the court formulated it in a bit different way, but said once you basically invoke your conscientious objection, uh, the authorities have the duty to assess whether the objection is legitimate, and if it finds that it's legitimate, the state must not enforce uh, the vaccination by a fine, for instance. Okay, so you can't be fined. Of course, you cannot be physically forced uh, for the vaccination, even though I don't know how it looks in uh, like um, uh, the surgeries of uh, like um, child. Physicians, I guess that anyone who has children knows how uh, vaccination takes place, that you have to hold the hand of the child to get the vaccine in, uh, included in the body. But uh, I don't discuss this. But physically, basically, uh, there is no way how this could be forced. And uh, definitely the state can't fine you. Okay, there cannot be any financial penalty enforcement of the vaccination. So uh, the, set, the court said, yes, you can use this conscientious objection, secular conscientious objection in relation to compulsory vaccination. And it devised a four step test, which in some sense you can also find in the older religious, uh, religious objection uh, case, but not so explicitly. Okay, here it was really put. This is the test which you have to follow, 
as a public authority who decides whether the objection was justified or not. So this is the test. It has got four, four stages, four prongs. Uh, constitutional relevance of justifications of conscientious objection, which basically means that once you argue that your uh, constitutional rights are interfered with, are violated, are at stake, that's fine. Okay, this, this step is fulfilled. The second, the urgency of justifications. Basically, uh, the court says that there must be some feeling of unconditional duty. And in this very first case, uh, the one, uh, US uh, 1253 uh, one, two, uh, slash 14, uh, they basically said that sufficient would be the fear of uh, irreversible damage to close being uh, by vaccination. So basically, if there was just this case, uh, even the fear conscience, just the one uh, where I think that some really irreversible harm would happen to my to my child, even though I have no you know more like profound belief behind this fear would be sufficient. Uh, but I must tell you that in uh, the other cases, and especially if I look at the case law through the lens of the European Court of Human Rights case law, I and Andre with me are not very sure that this, this is really what would, for instance, the European Court of Human Rights accept. Okay, uh, we think that currently uh, the fear is not enough. There must be something else. You have to base it on some more like general belief. Uh, consistency and cogency of justifications. Here, uh, the court said that uh, the authorities should assess what is, for instance, the vaccination history of the family. Okay. Were there any negative health uh, consequences in the past? Uh, how come that now you uh, disagree with the vaccination, but a year ago your child was vaccinated and no problems appeared, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So basically, looking through uh, the vaccination history, and a very interesting part is number four, societal impact, where basically uh, this is, I think, the main like balancing part of the test, where you say, uh, okay, I understand that your reasons are this and this, but we also have to say. What's the situation in the state now? Okay, so what is, for instance, the epidemic situation? Or would uh, would this particular illness be very uh, like dangerous for uh, the class to which you are enrolled? And if it were so, then your uh, individual interests must must uh, must go away. You must uh, basically. Um, you must give way to the more important societal uh, interests uh, in, in the school. OK, so this, this is the test. Uh, I want to tell you that. Why did uh, the Constitutional Court uh, create, devise this test? Because, as I said, Article 15 doesn't have any limitation clause, so they really had to you know, put the possibility of doing some balancing within the test because they didn't have any clause which would say, yes, and this right could be limited if, say, some public order he did that. Okay. So this is the way how the Constitutional Court um, has, has devised the test. But theoretically, we could also work differently if uh, we looked at the matter uh, through how the European Court of Human Rights works with uh, issues of freedom of conscience or freedom of religion. First, they analyze whether there was some interference with the fundamental right. And once they say yes, there was an interference, then they ask, was the interference justified? Okay, so for instance, in the Bayatian case, which was the compulsory military service case, the one in which the court for the first time said, yes, you have the right to conscientious objection in relation to compulsory military service, and this right is protected by under, uh, by Article 9 of the Convention. So what basically they said, is your conviction sufficiently strong, cogent, serious, etc., 
And is the refusal a manifestation of your religion or belief? This is the trait about which I spoke that you have to have some, you know, backside theory, religion, belief behind the refusal. Fear is not enough. Um, so is this strong conviction? Is the conviction and the refusal the product of this or manifestation of this religion or belief? If so, then we have an interference and we move to the second paragraph of Article 9 and say, is the interference justified? So was it based by law? Was it uh, based in law? Uh, was it, uh, full, uh, was it uh, following some legitimate aim? And was it necessary in a democratic society to interfere in this right? So basically, uh, this is the way the methodology of the European Court of Human Rights. OK, but as I said, because uh, the charter, the Czech chart doesn't have limitation uh, close in relation to Article 15. That's why we have this special test. OK, so if I go back to this specific versus uh, general right issue. The Czech situation is which? Is it the general right conception or the specific right conception? Well, if we were logically uh, clear, then it must be the general right because the Constitutional Court found the possibility to invoke the right to conscientious objection in relation to compulsory uh, vaccination, even without any like uh, statutory footing, without any constitutional footing, which would say you have the right to exercise conscientious objection in relation to compulsory vaccination. For many years, we were really uncertain with my colleague uh, whether this is our, our correct, correct reading of the case. Uh, and then in 2020, the Constitutional Court said, yes, this is exactly the situation. So potentially, the right to conscientious objection can be applied throughout the entire legal system in tax area, in occupational area, everywhere. So, of course, the question is, would the same test apply in all the contexts or should the test be more con context sensitive? <coughs> we don't know yet. Okay. But as a matter of theory and, of course, a very like, important theoretical point, which can have um, like massive practical consequences, the court said, and it was judgment. Of the, it's, it's not it's not a procedural decision. It's a judgment. So it has got like legal, it's by, legally, legally binding decision. Uh, that the right to conscientious objection can be applied even in other contexts. Okay, not only uh, vaccination, medical service, uh, compulsory uh, military service, etc., or um, the military vaccination. Okay, so uh, good. Last remark is that the court always stresses that. Conscientious objection is always a very like exceptional measure. But I must tell you that in practice, we actually do not know how it operates. Because in practice, if you are a parent, you say in your um, like if, if you, when you are with your kids at the physician's office that you do not agree with the vaccination, they make a note and that's it. It's a, it's like a scrutinized note. And of course, the physicians should not be able to scrutinize them because they are like private persons. How can they judge whether it's legitimate, whether you are sincere, etc., cetera, et cetera. So basically, on the one hand, the court says that it should be in a very exceptional measure. But on the other hand, we do not know how the practice looks like. Um, so it's again a part of um, some possible future research in how actually this this case law works in in practice. Good. Um, fine. So, do you have any question in relation to conscientious objection? If not, then we can move to civil disobedience and uh, to uh, 
make it a bit quicker. Uh, we can basically use uh, as a starting point uh, the definition of civil disobedience uh, by John Rawls in his theory of justice. And I'm sure that you will see uh, very quickly the main differences uh, between uh, civil disobedience and conscientious objection. Okay. So basically, John Rawls says that it's a public, nonviolent, and conscientious breach of law undertaken with the aim of bringing about a change in laws or government policies. So if we, uh, you know, dissect the various uh, various uh, criteria and also add some other criteria which appear in uh, in uh, those parts of theory of justice which Rawls devotes to civil disobedience, we see that civil disobedience must be a public act. You want to you want to be seen when you commit uh, the law violation, the breach of the law. You want to be seen. Okay. In fact, Rawls is even more strict because he says that a proper civil disobedience must be announced beforehand. You have to say, look, the state, I will commit law violation. Please look at me. I will uh, be a law violator. I will be civil uh, disobedient. Uh, it must be nonviolent. Uh, I already mentioned that some newer conceptions of civil disobedience say that um, disobedience need not be always civil, that it can be even violent. Uh, in fact, I can make a small note. Uh, just uh, I think it's interesting that even though civil disobedience was originally understood as like civil, like citizen, citizens disobedience, it's a disobedience, uh, disobedience done by citizens. If you look at today's text, they understand the word civil not as pertaining to citizens, but as pertaining to the mode of the disobedient. Like it's civil, it's nonviolent, it's uh, peaceful, etc. Okay, very interesting, like shift of the meaning of the word civil. So it's public, it's nonviolent. It's conscientious, it's serious. You really, your motivations are very strong behind uh, the law breach. It must be, again, a breach of law. What's very interesting is that you, unlike conscientious objections, you want to bring about a change in that particle law or policy with which you disagree. So this is something which is very different from conscientious objection. Another difference is that in conscientious objection, you protect your personal integrity under most conceptions of conscientious objection, whereas in civil disobedience, you basically argue or appeal to some more broad principles of justice. And the last point is that you are willing to bear consequences, to bear the punishment, uh, which is because Rawls says, importantly, as a whole, you are a very like vital member of the community. You believe in the legal system. You are a civil member of the community. And your civil disobedience is basically your duty, your service to the legal system. You only disagree with this particular issue or policy or law. But otherwise, you are a loyal, uh, loyal member of, of the legal system. Um, so this is uh, Rose's, uh, Rose's idea of civil disobedience. Uh, of course, it has got many critics, uh, not only because uh, under some conceptions, for instance, uh, Gandhi's uh, disobedience would not be civil disobedience because uh, Gandhi definitely uh, didn't have fidelity to the British legal rule. So just this aspect would put him away from this conception. Uh, then another another criticism against this uh, this conception, uh, for instance, uh, goes from Joseph Ross, who basically says that we should not concentrate on the topic of violence, but should instead uh, work with the concept of harm. And he basically says, look, if you, for instance, block the highway, uh, 
because you want to be civilly disobedient. Uh, you can block even ambulances. It's not violent, but the harm which you cause can be very big. Okay, it can cost lives. So there is uh, there is a discussion about what's the value of this like harm or violence in the context of the civil disobedience. And as I said, we are witnesses of the so-called anarchic turn, uh, which basically means that um, some current authors say that as the society changes and as this is what they say, the marginalized groups in society do not have enough space and possibility to uh, well show their uh, disagreement, then that we should be more complacent with them using even violent means. Okay, anarchic term in civil dis disobedience uh, debate. Good. So uh, that's it. Direct and indirect uh, types of civil disobedience. Can you imagine what could be the difference between direct and indirect civil disobedience? It has got to do with uh, against which law you you uh, protest. If it's a direct civil disobedience, I directly breach the law which I hate. So, for instance, if you uh, think of uh, Rosa Parks and uh, the segregation policy in the United States, where she sat on the front seats uh, on the bus. Yeah, yes. So uh, she violated the rule with which she disagreed. She didn't want to leave her space and uh, let some white man to sit. She was punished for this uh, law breach and eventually succeeded because the policy was changed, the law was changed. So that's direct, uh, direct uh, civil disobedience. Indirect is that you basically breach some law uh, just to address or to show that there is something else in the legal system with which you disagree. So if I block, uh, for instance, uh, no, if I block, if I sit, uh, these are the sit-ins in, at universities, for instance, I sit uh, at the university hall, I refuse to leave the building, and I have slogans saying that uh, I think that the government is insufficient in solving climate change problems. OK, so I uh, breach one law, I violate one law. For instance, here I uh, refuse to leave the building even after the office hours are finished and everyone has the duty to leave the building. Not because I protest against the rule which prohibits me to be in the building after, say, nine o'clock in the evening, but because I want to address that there is this problem of climate change. Civil and uncivil, it's something which I already uh, which I already touched upon. Uh, civil is this like, nonviolent uh, disobedience. Civil, civil disobedience, it's, of course, uh, contradictio in addicto. Uh, but as I said, there is um, also this trend uh, showing or trying to, to convince that even violence can be in some aspects justified and and I think that is a very like um, important even in theoretical way of course we can ask what violence means is for instance if I shoot into the air is it violence do we mean violence only in relation to persons or also to to some objects? Uh, if I put eggs or throw eggs on shop shop uh, shopping windows, is it violence? So of course, there are no clear cut lines what violence can mean. Good. I want to ask you when we spoke about conscientious objection, I asked you about the justification of conscientious objection. What about Civil disobedience. What do you think? Is there any reason why we should cherish civil disobedience? Why we could think that it is important for our societies? Oh. 
quite fun in such cases uh, in, uh, in the past. Uh, in our days, in Poland. Okay, so the the answer is yes. And why? Actually, it's only why. Only one way to say something as citizens. Yes. Don't uh, don't uh, protect our laws now. Mm -hmm. All politicians. Perfect. Yeah. People like to try to do something for them. Excellent. So I would uh, say that what you say. Could be uh, could be uh, put into the camp of some like uh, promoting like democracy, your democratic voice. You want to influence the polity. Uh, you don't have other means, so you use civil uh, disobedience. All right. Uh, something else? Yes. So we can say that the civil disobedience is the, 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 the most qualified version mm -hmm. legally that legally correct legally approved but maybe that is more precise good and because when we go into the violence the the protest in some way are are losing this legal legally aspect mm. yes exactly and if you look at it through the uh perspective of the right to protest of course, again, I can view it either as a benefit uh, for me as a person because I have my human rights, my dignity, I need to express myself, I want to be a full member of the society, I don't want to be silent. But again, it has got also its societal value. I am full member of the society and I'm doing it, even though I know that I will be punished, I am doing it for the society. Okay, not only for me, but it's important for the society as well. Good. Um, and then if you think of what civil disobedience is, the, uh, say, uh, civil disobedience according to the book definition, you have to appeal to some principles of justice, to some, you know, like fundamental rights, etc. Uh, then you, of course, by using civil disobedience, you also promote or enhance those principles of justice. OK, so you don't have to argue only from the position of democracy enhancement, but you can also argue from the position of enhancing principles of justice, human rights, etc. OK, and for some people, those arguments are more strong than the democratic argument. OK, but of course, uh, the best uh, solution is to use uh, the arguments together. OK, and on the other hand, could there be any justification against accepting uh, civil disobedience, because I'm sure that, and you see it in the quotation at the beginning, that in the moment, civil disobedience are sometimes um, uh, looked at with some, you know, reservation, and only afterwards, usually they are honored, revered. So what could be the argument against accepting uh, the legitimacy of civil disobedience? Social peace. Mm -hmm. Yes. Would you like to uh, develop the argument? It's like that when we live in country and uh, it's a, it, and from one point of view of, of the to the, uh, from the people that live in society, mm -hmm. it's like the firstly the pe these people are are have another ways to say what that they need to say and didn't need the breaking the law isn't the first step that they should do mm -hmm. and uh, from the point of view of the governments that uh, that is sometimes better to to, to 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 not to not make some protest that may turn may overturn the governance and do some some kind of rebellion because th yes. there's always possibility that the civil disobedience grow to, to that pain. Yes, and especially if you were uh, the proponent of the even like uncivil, civil disobedience, definitely. Okay, thank you. Just uh, to close this uh, discussion about the justification, uh, I just wanted to note uh, what is uh, Rose's opinion about uh, whether uh, civil disobedience in specific cases is justified. Okay, so we move now from the very like theoretical debate about whether civil disobedience can be justified or not 
to the question of whether this specific civil uh, disobedience is justified. And has, he has three conditions which have to be assessed and fulfilled. Uh, he accepts as legitimate only uh, disobedience against serious and long-standing injustices. So it must be a really something which is uh, not solved for a long time. Uh, also, you have to appeal to widely accepted principles of justice, uh, which, for instance, for him uh, is discrimination. But for instance, eco uh, economic inequalities are not something which he would understand as being uh, as something which would be fulfilled uh, in this in this scenario. Uh, the civil disobedience uh, must be your last resort. You had to basically try to use any other possibilities. And thirdly, which is very interesting and controversial, he said that basically the civil disobedience have to be uh, like in coordination with other minority groups because uh, he thinks that uh, if you are not in coordination, you basically minimize uh, minimize your chances of success. And also, you risk uh, that uh, the public peace, etc., will be out of control. Okay. So that's he has rather strict conditions as to when uh, civil disobedience is is uh, justified. And uh, my last question to you is. Uh, Let's try to imagine that you are state officials and you have to think of how to respond to civil disobedient acts. So um, could you think of at what stages could the state's response come? Uh, I know that the question is perhaps too abstract. Uh, let's imagine you have uh, the police stage. You have a policeman who watches civil disobedience. Then you have, uh, say, some uh, public prosecutor stage. And then you have the court stage. OK. I answered my question <laughs> almost. Uh, but uh, as a policeman, you can either react or just leave the civil disobedient be going on. OK. As a public prosecutor, you have the discretion whether you will want to punish, whether you uh, will use uh, your authority or whether you will, again, uh, put a blind eye on that. And as courts, what possibilities or uh, powers you have as courts if you should uh, assess a civil disobedient act? So either you can say this was lawful, but do you think do courts usually say this? No, they say that it's it's law breach. Basically, it's even definition of civil disobedience that it's a law violation. So they must say yes, this was a violation of law. But the courts also do other things. They can, of course, punish you. But the punishment can be one which uh, is reflective of the character of the law breach. OK, so if you have a sufficiently like, democratic system, which is secure of itself, etc., usually the courts um, think of this aspect of civil disobedience and, for instance, impose uh, suspended sentences or, you know, very like um, small fines. They really they want to express that uh, they see the act as unlawful, but they do not punish that, that seriously. Okay, because democratic systems uh, usually see the worth of civil disobedience uh, for democracy and justice, etc. In the system, um, do you agree, or do you think should? Quite uh, interesting cases now yeah. with the Polish Yiddish there. So I think that it could be a good material for you to read. Yes, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Sometimes uh, there are quite interesting uh, judgment, but sometimes uh, it is the other side of uh, not quite correct thinking about uh, this kind of institution. And uh, 
Mm. You know, one of the very basic ideas about civil disobedience is that any justification debate basically uh, rests on the preliminary idea that we have a reasonably just society and that we have a moral duty to follow the law. If we have, uh, or if we agree with this idea, then uh, I have put forward arguments why I breached the law. However, of course, the question arises, what about unjust societies or societies which are more unjust than just or which are unjust in certain specific ways? Do, does the debate shift? Can we use the same arguments as in just societies? Um, I don't have clear answers, but I'm definitely curious about those cases. Uh, as regards the Czech Republic and um, professional work, and if somebody is not enough professional now in this work, uh, result maybe is good, but the uh, context uh, and the information for society is not good. It, it is uh, quite often a big problem with these judgments. Mm -hmm. for, for instance, this it is uh, too complicated for me to uh, explain it in English. Thank you. In the Czech Republic, uh, I checked uh, the case law of the Constitutional Court working with uh, civil disobedience. Basically, it does appear in some argumentation, but uh, mostly in a very like uh, not detailed way. Uh, basically, the petitioners uh, usually argue that if some law violation was also an act of civil disobedience, that uh, public authorities, uh, that is administrative agencies and later than courts, uh, administrative courts, basically should uh, think or should believe or should be persuaded that the law breach is not uh, substantively uh, dangerous for the society and therefore it is not a true like legal breach. Okay. Uh, However, the Constitutional Court does not uh, follow this argumentation and always says that uh, when it reviewed the decisions of uh, lower courts, that uh, it is good, the, the, court, the lower courts have understood the value of civil disobedience. They uh, assessed the arguments of uh, the petitioner, but uh, they correctly, uh, they correctly weighed the balance or found the balance between the worth of the civil disobedience in this context and the protect the interests which uh, the particle legislation protects. So, for instance, uh, the safety uh, which are uh, which is uh, protected by some mining regulation, because, uh, for instance. Uh, one of the main uh, areas in which uh, civil disobedience appears is when the activists block the mining machines. They are punished because they uh, refuse to leave uh, the machines, of course, because it is dangerous for them to be there. Uh, and uh, they were fined, uh, but just very small, small uh, fines, uh, nothing really serious. Uh, and uh, the court, the courts, including the Constitutional Court, held that uh, the protection of their health and, of course, also the economic uh, benefits of the mining have uh, been uh, have superseded uh, the interest in uh, the protection of civil disobedience as such. Okay, good. Fine. Uh, I just wanted to ask you: Have I changed your opinion, or did your opinion change as regards whether it is more uh, justified to accept a uh, conscientious objection or civil disobedience, or uh, did your like preliminary thinking or inclination uh, remain the same? Is there anybody whose ideas changed a bit?
I would like to see your heads now and your consciences because I can't. Uh... Yes, yes, Jishka. <laughs> I didn't uh, change my mind. <laughs> and that was it? What, what was your, your, your vote? Uh -huh. this, uh, but uh, I would like to add that uh, it's not a theoretical uh, concept, uh, because if you remember, we have a colleague, I will not name him, uh, who was uh, against the wearing of masks mm -hmm. during the yeah. during the COVID uh, infection. And, uh, but it's not only him, that was the yeah. big, I would say, I don't know uh, if it fits to your uh, definitions, to your notions, it's a little on the side, I believe. But uh, of course, uh, uh, and what we perhaps didn't mention is that uh, uh, very important is the uh, as the definition was here by you all, so it was correct, and I agree with it. That, but uh, and he he says that it must be very serious, very serious intention to express something or to be against something and so on, and uh, uh, you must somehow measure the proportion yeah. of the index and what what. I believe it's not very pleasant to wear the mask, but uh, if I measure the balance mm -hmm. between wearing the mask, uh, I, I, I agree that it was uh, uh, prescribed on the, on the places on which it was nonsense. We know we, we know it now after, from the from the we know it now from our perspective, but we didn't know it at the time. And uh, on the other side, the health of the people, the uh, big uh, pandemic uh, infection and so on. So uh, perhaps uh, it wouldn't fit to this, uh, to this uh, very, very perfect, perfect definition. I have never seen it. So it, it was uh, the change of my mind because really this definition is, is very nice. I, I have read the, uh, the book of um, Professor Kisela. Uh, before, uh, mm -hmm. time before, but I've forgotten that perhaps he has this definition also. But it's uh, just now it's really very good uh, thinking about the uh, about the civil disobedience uh, and also because of the vaccination about uh, about the conscience. Mm -hmm. But it's it's uh, on the one side is a little dangerous yes. <laughs> concept, especially when we see. France and so on. So, <laughs> so uh, I believe it's necessary somehow uh, to measure, but it's in the in the definition. I, I agree with you. Uh, exactly. I think that uh, one of the reasons why we have to be cautious in relation to those concepts is that uh, not only theoretically, but as you said, practically, to decide is this really. Uh, civil disobedience, or is it just because I don't like, you know, wearing masks? It's, it's breathing difficult for me, etc. But you know, there's no conscientious in it. I could uh, happily uh, live, etc. On. So I think this is part of the problem why we should be skeptical and want should should want some justification of it. And uh, one of the arguments which I found interesting, uh, I personally. I'm a bit more fun or, or fun, fun of fan of uh, conscientious objection than civil disobedience. I'm a bit uh, like uh, afraid of civil disobedience, uh, but I find a very interesting argument by Kimberly Brownlee, uh, the one philosopher which I mentioned at the beginning, that she basically is of the opposite of the opposite idea or opinion, because uh, she says, look, uh, civil disobedience are prepared to be punished uh, for their belief. They risk the punishment because they do everything publicly, etc. And therefore, basically, we should be uh, like more respectful for civil disobedient acts than to uh, conscientious objection. And I again understand this, this argument very much. So, uh, do you have any comment or question, or want to share some Polish uh, Polish experience? Yeah. 
still, still uh, is uh, rather for protecting a single single person. And uh, we have a uh, big uh, background with our history, so for us, there's not a so new civil disobedience, uh, but now we have uh, a law instrument uh, to, pro to mm -hmm. treat it in, uh, in a proper way, and uh, it could be most of danger for people who take risk to, to, mm -hmm. to use it. But uh, in fact, they uh, did it when it was uh, necessary, it is not uh, normal. It, 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 it is a good instrument for a difficult times. Um, I can go back to the quotation at the beginning. And I said that you will be cherished in retrospect and abstracto, even though it may be difficult uh, in the moment for everyone who descends. Okay, so uh, I don't know what's the time. I think we are close to the end. So thank you very much for your um, patience. Thank you. <laughs>